you ready for a reboot? Welcome to the Sheila Mack Show, reality at its finest. History reminds us those hit hardest often become the change makers. This year, we've all hit crazy economic, social, and emotional rock bottoms. We all get knocked down. Something hits globally, locally, personally. It affects our health, finances, our relationships. We have to recreate a business or career. Each show, Sheila and her special guest will be sharing their reboot stories, guiding you with real solutions to upgrade and up-level emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. Here on NBC's KCAA Radio. If you're ready to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and bra straps, enjoy a listen. Here's Sheila. Welcome to the Sheila Max Show, reality at its finest. Here we have real people sharing real stories and actionable steps to help you reinvent, to rebuild, and reboot your business and personal life on your terms. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and today we have special guest, Sydney West. Sydney is a lawyer and the producer behind Seek the Joy podcast and stories of inspiring joy. Every week, Sydney sits down with thought leaders in health, wellness, mindfulness, and empowering conversations, as well as heartfelt storytellings on all the things like self-love, joy, connection, empowerment, and wellness. Sydney's greatest mission is to uplift and empower others to find their authentic voice, encourage them to step into their vulnerability and courage, all to seek their joy and bring about a greater world. Through Seek the Joy and Stories of Inspiring Joy, she's been able to do just that. All right. Welcome to the show, Sydney. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. <laughs> and this show actually came about from my new best-selling book, Bootstraps and Bra Straps, the formula to go from rock bottom back into action in any situation. And this last, I don't know, 13, 14 months, mm -hmm. we have had situations that are unimaginable that we could not even fathom <laughs> before. Yeah. And so I like to start off with maybe if you have a time in your business or personal life where you had to overcome a tough situation and how you got back on track. Hmm. You know, there's been so many. I think we all uh, face these moments of, of, of adversity, of challenge. And I think it's about always how we, you know, pick ourselves back up as your title of your book. So wonderfully suggest. But I think, you know, the biggest moment for me happened in 2016. So we've got to go back about five years. I was preparing to graduate from law school and about a month or so before I had shingles. And it was kind of my body's the first time my body sort of spoke to me and said, hey, you need to slow down. You're really stressed out. Maybe things are not going. You're not moving in the way that you're supposed to. And I was 25 at the time, and I kind of thought really not much of it. I figured, oh, it's a health thing that comes up, you know, as one does. I graduate from law school. Shingles was gone. I sat and studied for the California bar exam, which at the time was three really gruel, intense, intense, very intense days. And you study for about 10 weeks. And I had put my mind and my body through the ringer, studying, you know, upwards of 16 hours a day, not taking breaks, not nourishing myself properly, not seeing the sun. I just was so afraid of this exam and in such deep fear. And so by the time I sat for the bar exam in July of that summer, um, I came out of that experience the sickest I had been in my entire life. I had, you know, my health was not where it was supposed to be. Mentally, I wasn't in a good place. A month later, I had appendicitis. So again, my body was like, hello, <laughs> wake up. Like, this is not great. You're not taking good care of yourself. You're not tuning in in a way that you needed to. That still was not the wake up call for me. Mm. It really wasn't until November where when I found out I did not pass the California bar exam that I finally got it, that everything in my world, the way that I saw it kind of was my rock bottom because for my whole life I had based who I was and my self-worth on the external, on how I performed on an exam, what school I got into, what other people thought of me. And here I was, I didn't pass this licensure exam that I needed to practice law. I had been preparing for it my whole life. I was really sick and still recovering from surgery and having a really difficult time. And it wasn't until about a month or so later when I realized, okay, we have to 
pick ourselves back up and figure this out. I'm a big believer in allowing yourself to experience whatever emotions you are experiencing in the moment. So for me, it was really important to feel bad and to feel that shame or feel that embarrassment and feel that disappointment. And then I decided, okay, let's let's move through this. I went through a sort of nine-month metamorphosis and journey with myself, learning to take better care of my health, learning be- to take better care of me mentally, emotionally. And so by the time I sat for the bar the second time in July 2017, was a totally different person. I was not in fear of this exam. I was like, I'm going to conquer you. You're not going to conquer me. I'm going to conquer you. And I really had to learn how to shift my mindset in a really powerful way so that I was able to move forward. It wasn't until about two months after I sat for the bar that I had this idea. I really wanted to connect with other people who had similar stories and experiences or her doing what you and I are doing right now, Sheila, and just having a really wonderful conversation. And I thought, I'm going to start a podcast. That's what I'm going to do. And so within two weeks, I launched Seek the Joy podcast. Uh, I had the idea, the name, the whole thing. Uh, And for me, Seek the Joy has really been this incredibly healing journey and experience. In November of 2017, I found out I passed the bar exam, so I became a lawyer, which uh, was a huge moment for me. But my self-worth was no longer wrapped up in how I performed. So I knew even if I didn't pass, I would be okay. I would figure it out. I would pick myself up and do it again. So my journey of having this podcast, which has come from my rock bottom moments and learning how to pick myself back up and continue to seek my joy has really existed simultaneously. So it's it's been really wonderful. Wow. That is that is quite a journey. And <laughs> anybody who passes the bar, hats off. I, I know my best friend took it a few times, I think, and, and finally passed it. It's really tough. It is extremely yeah. tough. And, you know, more than anything, I think it's a mental game. You know, obviously you need to show you are able to retain all this material and apply it. But ultimately, you know, given the way it's set up, it's all about your your mentality and your ability, I think, to to push through and believe in yourself more than anything. So, yeah, it's not uncommon, I think, too, to take it more than once. So yeah. hats off to your friend, too. That's incredible. Yes, yes. So I am wondering now, you've been doing the Seek the Joy podcast and Inspiring Joy. Yeah, Stories of Inspiring Joy. I've been doing Seek the Joy for about three and a half years, and I've had Stories of Inspiring Joy for about a year. And Stories of Inspiring Joy was really um, – Based on a series I had on Seek the Joy for about two-ish, two and a half years, uh, it was called The Power of Storytelling. And people would come on and just share who they are and share their story uninterrupted. And I loved that series on the show because it was so healing and cathartic for people to come on and share either a moment of adversity or something they overcame, how they wrote their book, Mm -hmm. uh, their music, poetry, whatever. And then 2020 hit, and this series was booked 10 months in advance. And I was like, this is not sustainable. I can't have someone signing up in February for something to come out in November. So I thought, all right, we're going to start a second podcast. And so that's how Mm -hmm. Stories of Inspiring Joy was born. We're about a year into it. I've shared over 100 stories. uh, And each one is really powerful and and has left a wonderful impression on me. So it's been fun. Wow. Now, how does that um, come into alignment with your law business now with what you're doing for work. Hmm. How do you how do you balance those two? It's an interesting journey balancing both being a lawyer as well as a producer and podcaster, but truthfully, it has been such a beautiful compliment and I wouldn't have it any other way. When I was 12, I was one of those kids who just decided they wanted to be a lawyer. I had no real reason. I just woke up one day and was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. That's what I'm going to do. And so everything I did, you know, from that moment on was to get me to law school. And it really wasn't with, until the last year when I sat down with myself and I thought, why law? Why did I go to law school? And I realized from a very young age, I wanted to be an advocate. I wanted to be an advocate for myself. I wanted to be an advocate for others. And when I was 12, the only model I had for advocacy were lawyers. I didn't know that you could be an advocate through storytelling, through creating intentional spaces for people to really show up as who they are and to shine, I think, their light the brightest. And so for me, 
I'm now figuring out, I really want to be an advocate through storytelling. And I want to be an advocate by creating this space I've created with the podcast. Mm -hmm. And so it's really been a beautiful compliment, you know, having both at the same time. Um, You know, lots of things I learned in law school and use in my everyday life, I apply to, you know, being a podcaster and a producer. And it's really, um, it's been a beautiful compliment for me. But stepping into that knowing about advocacy has been the biggest game changer for me because it makes me understand a little bit more about myself and why I'm doing this and, and why it's also important to me. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's the key is when you are doing your work and you're on purpose to help other mm-hmm. people, then you wake up and you have this reason for getting out of bed. It's just a different thing. And everything that you need shows up, the time you need, the, yeah. the sponsors, whatever you need to continue always shows up in perfect time. And so it's it's kind of going with heart, heart mm. business, heart based work, and and how that can connect to everything that we're doing as as an advocate. You're mm-hmm. helping people in all you're doing. Now, how does your self care? How does that look now that you've you know got your degree and you're working and you've got some balance going? Are you able to take care of your health and find time for yourself? Mm. You know, like anything else, it's a constant journey. It's a constant process. And it's been it's been a journey with a lot of trial and error, if I'm going to be very honest. Um, I, I think now I've, I'm in the best place with my health and I've been in a really long time. And it's because I've had to be very intentional about it. I am somebody that when I get an idea and I want to do something, I rush to that computer and I sit there forever. And I've really had to to teach myself, we need to take breaks. You need to walk. You need to move. You need to eat. You need to drink water. And so sometimes, you know, I've got to set a reminder on my phone to make sure I do it. Um, But I definitely think I'm in a much better place now with my own personal self-care. And, you know, through the podcast, I've had so many conversations with people about their self-care and what does that look like. And what I'm really learning is self-care is really holistic. It's mind, body, and soul. It's so much deeper than what we often talk about in you know, mainstream media or society. And so for me, having that lens and knowing that self-care is going to be holistic and needs to be holistic has actually helped me to alleviate any pressure that I might have put on myself. You know, often I think, especially when you're in a self-care, self-love journey, learning to speak to yourself with more kindness. If you have a day where you fall off the wagon, you feel really bad about it. You're like, um, I put in all this work to mess up this one time. The yeah. truth is, is it's a journey. You go up and down. You have highs and lows. And so giving myself that level of grace and uh, patience, patience has been huge, you know, and knowing you can just try again tomorrow. So I've definitely gotten so much better, treat myself with a lot more kindness than I did probably when I was in law school or even undergrad. Yeah. Um, and it's made a huge difference. But I am constantly learning just to – go with the flow and not be so hard on myself. Mm, That's so important Mm -hmm. for anyone listening in. If you have a business or a career, like something in the legal field that, that you're going to be required to sometimes over-focus because you've got to, you know, go to court tomorrow. So you might have to stay up late or do something different to get everything you need together. Then make sure that you give yourself a buffer of time in your in your schedule where you have that day to recharge or half a day or whatever you can and put yourself in that schedule like you're a client. Mm. Yes, because we I love that. To, yeah, we tend to forget and it's really easy when the overfocus of being able to serve so many other people shows up and serves you to get your degree to help so many people with what you do, then it's we often forget that that also can hurt us, even though it served us for so many years, if we don't take charge. So you've already set, set your timers and you have ways of pulling yourself away to get back on track with, with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's something, I don't know, all the business people I know that are super successful, they get really focused Mm. on whatever they're doing. And sometimes it's so easy to forget to eat or to not eat or to, or to go <laughs> exercise or to, you know, get some sunshine or all, yeah. you know, that maybe the family in the other room wants your attention and you're like, well, I'm working on this project and that's how you become so successful. So it's, it's a, it's kind of a, it causes confliction mm. many times 
for business leaders in any field. And so when, you, when you're able to be present at work and then present at home with the family and present for your self-care or you know, present with your friends, that's gonna make a difference over the long term, or else you're with your family and friends and you're thinking about maybe a court case or or whatever your business is. And then when you're at the business, you're thinking, oh, I should have given my friends or family more time. Then you're you're not really a hundred percent in either place. And that's that's like the worst place to be. And everybody's upset because they're like, hey, I need your your presence. Mm. Yes. I think that's so interesting. It's all about how do I remain present in this moment mm-hmm. instead of thinking about the thing that's due or the thing I forgot to do or, you know, um, the deadline. And I think over the last year, we have really been thinking more about that. How do I stay present in this moment? Mm-hmm. It is so much harder than I think a lot of people make it seem, especially when you are overwhelmed, you have a lot going on. And I am certainly someone that's still trying to figure that out. I mean, sometimes that means I put the phone away, like I literally tuck it under the mattress. So we're not looking at it, you know, you turn the phone off and you tuck it away. Otherwise, you feel like compelled, you know, to constantly check it and tune in and what are your friends doing? What's going on? with the emails, with social media, it's, you're so right. It's really about how do I stay present in this moment? You know, so later on I know, okay, I gave my family my attention. Now it's my time to give my work my attention. Now it's my time to give myself my attention. I think about it as like those sort of three buckets Mm -hmm. and you know, you can't, you're, I feel like sometimes you're constantly pouring from one bucket into the other, but it's like, how can we make it even across the board for ourselves? Um, so we don't feel, you know, pulled in one direction or overwhelm or, or overloaded. It is quite a journey figuring that out. Yes. And this year has been so interesting, a reminder, this universal mm-hmm. pause yeah. to really slow down and have that family time. I had one of my daughters moved home and uh, some of my other kids visit more often. It's one of those situations where family time, you realize what matters most mm-hmm. and I, as a mom, I'm like, I'm enjoying every second of this family time. And yeah. the, the universities are finally opening up in the fall. And I'm like, I'm going to miss you. I know. <laughs> I know. I kind of feel that way too. You know, the last year has definitely been difficult and yeah. has really challenged us. And I think if anything, we learned what's really important. Just like you said, it's really our health and our family. Because mm-hmm. if you don't have your health, you have nothing. And then if you don't have the ones you love, you know, life isn't, doesn't have that same sense of fulfillment. And for a lot of us, we were on this hamster wheel, especially with work and mm-hmm. with our businesses or our passion projects of, you know, the foot was permanently on the accelerator. And I think for the first time as a collective, as a global community, we had to say, wait, hold on. Mm-hmm. If you keep that foot on the accelerator, it's not going to serve you. And so I feel the same way. I have a little apprehension about going back out into the world. I have loved my time at home, you know, nurturing myself, nurturing projects that I'm really excited about being with my family. But I think it's for me, especially it's about taking the lessons of the last year Mm -hmm. and that sense of nurturing and how can I apply it to every aspect of my life, including the aspects of my life that require me to be outside of the home, you know, yeah. that require me to be present in new ways. And it's going to be interesting to see how we can sort of integrate those lessons that we learn personally, mm-hmm. but then also as a collective, you know, as we, we start to immerse back into the world again and return to whatever this new normal is going to be. Yes. I remember finally when the stores were open again and we were actually able to go buy an outfit my yes, and we were like, "This is so exciting!" The mall, <laughs> like <laughs> all the things we kind of took for granted before, right? All of a sudden, are so new and exciting and shiny, and it's really, it's so interesting. It's it's Even crazy. Target, a trip to Target was exciting at first. Yes, like oh my yeah. god, they're letting us in the stores now. This is great. We can I get know. socks or whatever. <laughs> My new puppy ate all the sauce. Oh, I love that. Did you get a puppy within the last year? Yes, we did. We adopted a golden doodle. And she, that first year with a puppy oh. is a lot of work. So we yeah. both did need to be home full yeah. time for that. Yeah. that I believe puppy. it. And now she kind of owns us and she is incredible. My, my daughter said that was our therapy dog. Um, oh. I lost my youngest son. In December of 2019, he was 22. He had a heart degree, um, uh, heart situation. It was Wolf Parkinson, and he just didn't wake up one day. And mm. we were always worried. We almost lost him in fifth grade. So 
with that, my daughter's like, we need to get a dog. Mm -hmm. Trust mm -hmm. me, I need to hug a dog. And <laughs> we your need daughter was so right. Yes. And, and I was wow. like, okay, I'll get you a dog. What's the dog sleeps in my bed. <laughs> okay. You needed a dog. I think she got the dog for me. I mean, they're best friends too, but it just mm -hmm. happens that that's the way it, it, I don't know, it turned out. So yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah, Really? That's so difficult. I'm so glad that you were all able to find the companionship though through through getting a puppy, a quarantine puppy. Yes, yes. So healing. I love that. Yes. And we have two rescue kitties as well. Oh. So we we You have a full house. We really do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So good. So that's something. Now I'd love to hear maybe some examples of um, your program and what the inspiring joy and what are some of the stories that really stuck out in your mind mm. um, that affected you or made yeah. a difference? Yeah. Okay. There's so many, I don't even know where to begin. You know, in the last three and a half years of having Seek the Joy podcast, and that's really an interview focused show, I've sat down with some really like incredible people um, and people I would never have really had the opportunity to meet, get to know um, and truthfully become friends with, which has been so wonderful. And I think, you know, especially in the context of the conversation we're having now about the last year and stepping into greater self care for yourself, there's, there's a couple conversations I've had. One was with um, John Clarence Stewart and he's an actor. Uh, he's right now he plays Simon on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. And um, we had a beautiful conversation on art and creativity as healing mm. and how we can use it as part of our healing journey to step into our voice, to step into who we really are. And I, I mean, I loved that conversation because especially it gave me such an interesting perspective on healing for for men or those who identify with the male energy and what how that is so similar to women we often think of self-care for women self-care in a more feminine spaces but really self-care and, and healing is universal and so i so appreciated his perspective and the conversation that we had another conversation that has really um left a profound impact on me is with this woman. Her name is Audrey Ori, and she's a publisher. She has a publishing house called 13th and Joan. She's phenomenal. We had a wonderful conversation on why now more than ever, we really need to document our own stories mm -hmm. and how powerful it is to take control of your narrative and write it down, paint it out, dance it out. I think especially in the last year, you know, we're learning, um, write down how you're feeling, write down what you're experiencing. And it's so powerful. And for me, it just really confirmed our conversation really confirmed for me why I do the second podcast stories of inspiring joy. I'm such a firm believer that we all have a story to share. We all have a voice that's really meant to be heard. And often we don't know that we are empowered to share our story. Sometimes we think, oh, it's reserved for like a celebrity or someone who's really well known or someone who has really undergone tremendous adversity. The truth is your experience is important. What you experience every day, how you see the world, what has happened to you, how you move through it is important. And I think it's meant to be shared because mm -hmm. when you share your story, you have no idea the impact that really it's going to have not only on you, but also on someone else. And so for me, that's really where stories of inspiring joy comes from. And I mean, recently we just had um, this woman come on and share her story and she actually did it with her counselor who helped her heal um, while she was, um, I think it was disassociative identity disorder. I believe that's what she was experiencing or, or what she has. And the, the story they share of how they work together and they healed, she healed and how this woman who served as her coach through all of this um, or her therapist um, also has her own sense of healing through working with clients. I mean, it blew, it blew me away. Um, there's been people who have come on and shared their music, like how they wrote their, their first album. And I was like, oh my God, not only is your music so beautiful, but to hear the story of what inspired you to share your music in this way, I mean, it's just, it blown me away. So those are just a few examples. But when I tell you, I am just so honored to share these stories and to have conversations with people. Sheila, you're, you shared your story on stories of inspiring joy, what brought you to writing bootstraps and bra straps, and you have an incredible story. So for me, it's just been, it's been a huge honor. And if you had told me this 
when I failed the bar the first time that I would have been able to create two podcasts now uh, that provide opportunities for connection and storytelling, I would have laughed. I would have said, no way. There's no, no way at all. So it has been a huge honor. Absolutely. That's, that's your art. That's Mm -hmm. beautiful. And there was this, all the things that you told me, all these different people you interviewed, it was how they were sharing their voice, their Mm -hmm. art, writing through art, through singing, through whatever they're doing to be an advocate for others, Mm -hmm. all those things. And I think about when we are children, Mm -hmm. we have that, we play. You think of the masculine energy, I don't know, and the feminine, it doesn't matter. Some of us love, I was a sports kid. I I was very, I loved sports. I didn't want to be benched. I wanted to go play sports. (laughs) You wanted to be on the field. (laughs) I want to be on the field. I may not play well, but I want to go play. And so that was me. But the thing that happens is we grow up Mm. take a big test. We go to school, we get the job, and we forget to play. We forget to fuel our own souls. And and then there's resentment hmm. because we've lost that. That's the joy, that yeah. essence, that really, you know, if you love to swim, that's your release, that's your meditation and motion, whatever it is. If you give that up because you're a grown up, this, this crazy mm-hmm. or some kind of rule, yeah. you can't dance anymore in public because that would look weird or, you know, whatever it is, just, oh, you're off key. So what if you want to sing, sing? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think what you just said is so on point. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mack show here on KCAA radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack. And today we have a special thank you shout out to the sponsor of this episode and that is Davy Piper. Davy Piper is a women's essential and intimates company that gives women unapologetic confidence, style, and comfort, no matter age or body type. Davy Piper celebrates the stories of remarkably brave women through their products. Each woman has a different story to tell, but they all seek to leave the world better than they found it, with premium clothing designed to make women feel as amazing as they are. Davy Piper's mission is to Davy Piper's mission is a comfortable bra in every woman's wardrobe. Visit DavyPiper.com to learn more about Davy Piper's commitment to empowering women. What I find most comfortable and amazing about this product is they have premium super soft fabrics, including bamboo and organic cotton. It's supportive, wire-free bras made for hard-to-fit sizes, including specialty busting sizes for Eid Eye Cups. They have sports bras, sleep and comfort bras, versatile everyday bras, and more. Ultra-comfortable bras, undies, sleepwear, loungewear, and activewear. Flattering classic styles with a modern twist. Fashionable features and thoughtful details. So... Try DavyPiper.com to get your comfort on this season. And you can go to DavyPiper.com, D-A-V-Y-P-I-P-E-R.com, and use code Sheila Mac 20 That's discount code Sheila, S-H-E-I-L-A, Mac, M-A-C, 20, Sheila Mac 20 to save 20% on your purchase. And because often, you know, when I think about, for me, the podcast came because I needed to seek my joy, Mm -hmm. truthfully. And the name of the show was inspired by a conversation I had with someone back in 2015. And he said, you need to seek your joy. You need more joy in your life. And at the time I thought, are you crazy? I'm in law school. I'm just trying to get like pass. I'm trying to pass this bar exam. I'm just trying to become an adult. A serious adult, mm-hmm. as you put it, which I think is so perfect because we often think, you know, when we reach a certain age, we have to be serious in order to be taken seriously. We think we have to present ourselves a certain way in order to be accepted. The truth is, who you were as, you, as a kid 
what you love to do, if you loved playing, you know, sports or rolling around in the mud or doing something with clay and Play-Doh, you know, you were tapping into a part of yourself that was often, I think, the fullest expression of who you were, what you really loved, how you wanted to express yourself, how you wanted to share who you are with the world. And you're right, as adults, we forget that. And I certainly forgot that. And I think that's in part why I didn't pass the bar and why I had all these health issues is because I was too serious. I was like gripping way, way, way too hard and not letting myself be in the moment, not letting myself experience life, have joy. Um, you know, enjoy my life. And so I think, you know, what I've learned, especially through the podcast is if you can think about what you love to do when you were younger, when you were a kid, what made you happy, what you could spend hours doing, if you can now incorporate that into your day-to-day life as an adult, you will be so much healthier, Mm -hmm. so much happier, and you will actually enjoy what you're doing. I had a conversation recently on Instagram Live uh, with this woman. Her handle is The Playful Warrior. She's all about how we can incorporate play into our lives as an adult. And I loved it. It's about expressing your creativity and doing it without self-judgment. You Mm -hmm. know, like what you said, like, what are people going to think about me? (laughs) Honestly, I'm at this point where it's like, "Ah, who cares? If it makes you happy and you love it, keep going, keep doing it. That's, that's really all that matters. So learning to bring joy and more play into your life as an adult. Mm -hmm. So I I think about relationship work when I work with couples Mm -hmm. and what happens is they stop having that joy, the playfulness, the fun Mm -hmm. of a relationship, the dating stops, they get married, they have responsibilities, they have bills, children show up and it's, and then they have to be parents and serious and it's, and they've lost the most Mm. important thing. And the whole romance, the love part is the laughter and the joy in the little things in the real taking a walk as a family together Mm -hmm. or with as a couple and enjoying those times and playing and having fun. That's what makes the relationship. And when that stops, it kind of dies because you know, it's then it's just work. No fun. <laughs> we yeah. have to have some fun. Yeah. And, and yeah, and I think it's so interesting, you know, especially in the last year, people were taking walks as a family and yeah. going out and playing board games and watching movies together. I mean, uh, before last year, I can't tell you the last time I had played a board game. I mean, not in a really, really long time. So doing things that brought you together, you know, especially with those you loved. I know a lot of people spent the last year alone, uh, especially if you lived alone, which, I mean, I can't even imagine. I feel very lucky that I was with my family. But, um, yeah, bringing back that sense of play and connection and having fun together, it makes a huge difference. Mm. And then teamwork, working with your teams, with business. If if you can bring fun – now we have to maybe start going back to the workplace instead mm-hmm. of the Zoom, the Zoom calls where we just, we don't have to wear pants if we don't feel like it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now we have to get dressed up and go back to work. And people have gone through so much that if mm-hmm. work, if there can be a team meeting that's just positive and fun, yeah. if yeah. there can be things like that, especially during this time, it's going to make all the difference in productivity and people wanting to show up and feeling a sense of community at work Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. we really need. There's a lot of division right now on our planet as well. And so when we can come together, I think that's going to heal everything and and cure all this crazy virus and everything else is when we all come together. Mm -hmm. And so that starts, I think, from home, then to work, to the community, ways that you can help other people. And it, the podcasts that we're doing right now, I, I believe everybody listens in and they, they hear what they need to hear and it shows up in perfect time. Hmm. I think so too. That's so interesting you brought about you brought up about work and productivity and returning to the workplace. I recently just had a conversation for Seek the Joy with um, Scott Shute. He's the head of mindfulness and compassion pro- uh, programs at LinkedIn. Hmm. And my biggest takeaway from that conversation, he's all about mainstreaming mindfulness and operationalizing compassion, meaning bringing, bringing our mindfulness practices into the workplace so that we can show up as our full selves. And I 
think pre-pandemic, so many of us were not showing up as our full selves, especially at work. And you weren't bringing in what you were you were passionate about. You weren't bringing in your mindfulness practices, your self-care, your joy. And I loved my conversation with Scott because it's all about if we can show up as our full selves in the workplace, Mm -hmm. we're not only going to enjoy it so much more, but then we just start to develop this greater self-compassion. And compassion really has to also start at the top with leadership within any organization. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was just such a valuable conversation for me, especially as we begin this transition, you know, moving back to a workplace and not being on Zoom calls as much, which that's going to be an adjustment (laughs) in and of itself. Um, So there are so many incredible people out there who are really, I think right now, talking about exactly what you spoke of too. And I'm I'm really lucky I got to have that conversation with Scott um, for Seek the Joy because, yeah, being able to step into mindfulness and compassion so we can change work and how we show up at work, I think it's going to usher in a new way of thinking and a new way of being, especially in the workplace, because I don't think people want to work the same way they were before. I think things are changing. I think it's nice in a way to for some people it was really hard but to be able to be home with the family if you have family to share what you're doing for work Mm -hmm. with your loved ones so they can kind of understand sometimes you show up at home and you're like oh this happened at work but they don't have a clear understanding of what work really entails Mm -hmm. what it's like what's required and it's it's almost like if you have young children they don't have an idea of what it's going to be like once you graduate Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so that's to me that's a bigger education than than the textbooks and the stories also like your inspired the stories that you have where people Mm -hmm. share their stories those stories are the living history we're in like some some historic times right now and and to understand these stories from a place where there's emotion Mm -hmm. We're not, like you said, we're not holding our emotions in and people are sharing what they experienced, what they went through, how they got back on track. And that, that inspires other people and helps them so they can share their story and not, Mm -hmm. not hold it in. Mm -hmm. And it it just feels, Yeah. 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 There's a beautiful domino effect that happens when you share your story. And I'll I'll share this story of, of that domino effect. Um, it was about four or five months into having the power of storytelling, which is the series that inspired stories of inspiring joy on Seek the Joy. And someone had come on and shared their story. And I got an email from somebody in Germany who said, hey, I just heard this person's story. It really resonated with me. Could I share my story? And I said, please, like, I'd love for you to, of course, share your story. So a couple of months later, their episode goes live. They share their story. Somebody from Australia reaches out and says, I heard this story. It was really inspired. It reminded me of this instance in my life. Can I share my story? Mm. And I, I was like a year into doing this podcast. And I sat there and I was like, what? <laughs> like, you're telling me somebody – in the United States shares a story which inspires somebody in Germany, which inspires somebody in Australia. Like it blew my mind. And I really understood in that moment, the domino effect and how inspiring it is when you, you really, it takes a lot of courage, I think, and a lot of bravery to step into a space where you are sharing your story. We often fear what it means to be vulnerable. We fear judgment, we fear rejection. And so for someone to come on and share their story and for it to inspire somebody else to share theirs, I was like, this is it. This is why I'm doing this. Um, And it all just sort of made so much sense to me in that moment Um, because we often think we're alone in what we're experiencing. We think nobody else has these emotions. Nobody else has been in a situation like this. I think especially if we feel isolated in what we're experiencing, we don't know that we're not alone. And so for me, the biggest, one of the biggest, because there's so many, but one of the biggest takeaways from doing both podcasts over the last three and a half, almost four years, is this reminder that you are really never alone in what you're experiencing. And if you um, reach out a little bit and share who you are and share your story, it doesn't have to be on a podcast. It doesn't have to be online. It can be with a friend or, or some, or, you know, just even in your journal, it, it will just heal you and heal others. And it will resonate so much deeper, I think, than you could have ever, ever, ever imagine. Yes, yes. And this is the art of storytelling. Mm -hmm. My elders, when I had my grandparents 
and and they're my grandma's little friends and they were these older ladies and they were from different you know los angeles california so we had people from everywhere mm -hmm. and we had one lady that survived a concentration camp lost a lot of her family members found her siblings later and we had another lady from Greece who her husband passed away and she took over the business at a time where that was like totally frowned upon mm -hmm. and had to deal with all that and yeah. all these different people. There was about five older ladies and they would sit down and have tea and tell their stories. And I was this little girl and I'd listen in mm. and I think, oh, these stoic, incredible women, they, they have not lost their feminine. They are so in their truth and they're beyond, they're at that age where they were beyond caring what people thought. Mm -hmm. There's a certain age where you just don't care anymore. You like, yeah. you into that. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, I wonder what my adventure is going to be. I wonder what my mm -hmm. story is going to be. But that's, those stories stayed with me. And literally those ladies were like the grandparents for my children until they all passed away. We had Thanksgiving together, we had Christmases together. They were my extended family. And so that was something I kept those stories. I wanted my children even to hear these, the real history, the mm -hmm. lived history, the real experiences. And it made such a difference and an impression on me. So wow. This I love that. Keeping the tradition alive was sharing mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. and in our culture, we don't have that as much here with, with everything being apart. And now we have, we're sharing global stories. Mm -hmm. We've got all these different countries <laughs> and they're sharing stories. So, yeah. Yeah. I love what you just shared because it's also about how does your individual story fit into this collective story? And I think especially with the last year with COVID and there were multiple pandemics really occurring at the same time. Um, how does your story fit into this global, global story? And we all document it in our own way. Some of us write, some of us podcast, some of us write music. Um, I try and document, my family used to always laugh at me, but I try and document as much as I can with my phone, mm -hmm. with videos and pictures. And um, my grandpa passed away in October, 2020. And one of the most healing things for me has been going through this sort of album mm -hmm. of photos and videos and voice notes and uh, voicemails and just things that I, I documented that I know I would carry with me, you know, for the rest of, of my life. So the ability to document your experience, document your story and share it with others, I, it's just such a beautiful gift. And I hope that we continue to do it because uh, we need to, we need to document what, what we've experienced and what those of us around, around us have experienced too. I think it's so important. Definitely. Now, as a, a person that is doing so much, an advocate for everyone else, what do you have to share with the audience? What tips do you have if they are also taking on a lot of different things on really how to, I don't know, I don't know if it's balance, but man, manage it all. Yeah, it's so funny. For a long time, I, I thought, oh, I can balance everything. And then I realized personally, I don't know if I have balance. Like, I don't know if balance is a thing. I think we have like these buckets that I sort of spoke about earlier. And you label them based upon what is a core value or something that is important to you. And then you kind of have to decide, okay, how much am I going to fill in this bucket today? How much am I going to fill from this one? Do I need to take from one and fill it in the other? For me, that's really what I've had to do to be able to manage. I love the word manage because it really is about managing everything that is important to me in any given moment. And I am not an expert at it. I continue to learn. I continue to learn from those around me and from those I get to speak to through the podcast. But what has really helped me, and, and hopefully this will help others as well, is just making a decision sort of every day as to what I want to fill in each bucket, like how much I want to fill in each bucket. So for example, tomorrow, I know it's going to be a really, really busy work day. I will not be doing anything for, you know, the podcast at all. It's really just about work. And then I know as the week goes on, I know like, for example, on Thursday, I really want to make, you know, touching base with my friends and, and you know, calling somebody up and, and you know, touching base. And how is everybody? That's for me is a priority. So just managing my time in a way where I'm prioritizing things. I'm feeling, figuring out how much I want to fill each bucket. For me, that has been huge. And writing everything 
everything down. This is like, an, I'm, I'm so old school in the sense that I have a calendar that I write things down in, right? Yep. Like I, I don't just use the, the iCal on my, my phone. Like I, you you have, you do. Like I have to write everything down. So I know, you know, what I'm working on, what I, you know, need, how I need to prioritize my time. Otherwise it is just, it's just pure overwhelm. So writing it down, deciding how I'm going to fill in those buckets. And then this is the key for me, knowing it's not going to go that way. Like knowing it's not going to be exactly how I planned, knowing it's not going to be perfect and just kind of going with the flow and knowing I can carry something over to the next day too. So taking away sort of that inherent pressure uh, that I certainly put on myself. I know plenty of other people do that as well. That for, that for me has been important, but I don't know if there's balance. Like I think you just kind of decide how you want to allocate your time and your energy and you sort of figure it all out from there. Sometimes you got to take things out of the equation too. Like if it's too much, you know, don't be afraid to take away. I think sometimes we think if we've committed ourselves to something or we're working on something, that means we have to we have to keep doing it. Sometimes it's important to take away yeah. and to remove and you can always add it back in. Always add it back in later. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mack show here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mack, and I would like to give a special thank you and shout out to the sponsor of this episode, and that is Kindred Bravely, a premium maternity and nursing brand that makes it easy for mothers to find functional, stylish, comfortable clothing. Since launching in 2015, Kindred Bravely has grown into a sisterhood of moms who help each other transition from the bump to the breast and beyond. Kindred Bravely is here for moms no matter where they are on their motherhood journey. Their mission is a comfortable bra in every nursing mother's wardrobe. Things like premium super soft fabrics including bamboo and organic cotton, supportive wire-free bras for a variety of sizes including special busty sizing for E to I cups, bras for nursing, pumping, or both at the same time. Sports bras, sleep and comfort bras, versatile everyday bras, and more. Ultra comfortable bras, undies, sleepwears, loungewear, and activewear. Bump-friendly tops and bottoms, nursery-friendly dresses, tanks, and tees, and so much more. Visit kindredbravely.com and use discount code SHEELAMAC20 to save 20% on your purchase. That's at kindred, K-I-N-D-R-E-D, bravely, B-R-A-V-E-L-Y.com, kindredbravely.com. And use discount code SheilaMac20 to save 20% on your purchase. If you are just tuning in, this is NBC Sheila Mac Show here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. I'm your host, Sheila Mac, and I have a special Happy New Year announcement for you. That's right, just for beautiful, authentic you. So in this new year, I am personally plugging in all my 2022 up-leveling routines. That's right. I'm not doing goals or as much to say as I'm not just doing a resolution that I talk about or just write it down on a list. I'm actually already scheduling in the small acts that I need to do each day that are actually going to bring me results over this 365, I guess, or less now, uh, when you're listening in 363 to whatever it is, days. So at any rate, one of the things that I would like to introduce is that we will be having some talks on business and investing. That's right, business and investing reboots this year. So if you are looking to do a side gig or you have a business yourself, or you're in a career, and you are looking to earn some extra money, I have some tips and different things that my family, I have six grown children, we will all be participating in some of these and trying them out and sharing opportunities with you. And then we will also be talking uh, about real estate investing, which is something that I have done since I was very young. So my real estate investing experience 
comes from, well, when I was 18 and a half years old, I bought my first little triplex. <laughs> I was already working at Jet Propulsion Lab at, in JPL, JPL in Pasadena, California, where we have the famous Rose Bowl every year right near there. And so I saved up my money and bought this little triplex. It was very humble kind of fixer thing. And <laughs> I lived in the back teeny tiny unit and rented out the best parts to everyone else. I guess I was house hacking before that was a term and I continued to save up and invest. I was very creative on my financing, still going to school and working. So, you know, from that to investing in many different properties, I started gift stores at 23 and the first one I leased at 5,000 a month. And I said, wait a minute, you know, that's a lot of money to be giving to somebody, the landlord, every single month. And my mortgage, if I can save up enough to put down, I can get into a mortgage. And you know what? With business credit, which I will be sharing all about, I did just that. And business credit is a magical secret. So if you don't have a side gig, that's why that first part is important with your investing is to have that extra income or side gig, have an LLC or an S Corp. So setting that up at 23 when I started my gift stores, by the end of the first year, I had more buying power than most people. I had a corporation's buying power. Like they would give me credit. You can't believe I could just walk into any dealership and they'd have these specials. I'd get the best credit, like zero interest. I'd, I'd be able to negotiate the deals on things, you know, different vans or whatever I needed for the store. And it was just incredible. And I actually used the business credit to purchase some of the properties. One was the headquarters and rental property. And so I had some mixed use and I actually purchased the other four buildings and stopped leasing and just became an owner. Uh, and so I got into real estate and investing from that, from being an investor and then later as other store owners were really interested in, and wondered, wait a minute, you're half my age, they would say. <laughs> and how are you buying buildings? What is going on? And so with that, I went ahead and I got my real estate license and started sharing about that. Worked at a small um, owned brokerage. And then from there, um, helped and led some real estate courses for real estate agents on 1031 exchange and have done multiple 1031 exchanges and helped many small business owners and families to invest in property. So I'll be sharing about my journey and how this year, even if you think, you, you know, this sounds like, how is this possible? I'm going to help you figure out if that's something you're interested in ways that you can make it become a real possibility for 2022 moving forward. So I hope you tune into my show. There will be some upgrades. We will still be doing lots of incredible interviews with amazing people sharing about resources and reboots and ways they got back on track and hearing their stories. And also we will be getting step-to-step -step challenges and ways for you to tune in, call in, and ask questions and be guided to actually make 2022 a wonderful time for your business and your personal life. All right, so stay tuned. I'm looking forward to hearing from you soon. The Hebo Tea Club's original Pure Pouty Arco Super Tea helps build the red corpuscles in the blood, which carry oxygen to our organs and cells. Our organs and cells need oxygen to regenerate themselves. The immune system needs oxygen to develop, and cancer dies in oxygen. So the tea is great for healthy people, and it can truly be miraculous for someone fighting a potentially life-threatening disease due to an infection, diabetes, or cancer. A one-pound package of tea is $49.95 plus shipping. To order, please visit lovemysupertea.com. That's love, L-O-V-E, my, M-Y, super, S-U-P-E-R, T, T-E-A, dot com. So the complete website is lovemysupertea.com. Or call us at 818-288-4128, Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, California time.
That's lovemysupertea.com at 818-288-4128. Have you lost your job? Have you lost a loved one? Are you exhausted caring for your parents, for your kids? Well, you can find immediate relief when you read Sheila Mack's new number one bestseller, Bootstraps and Bra Straps. It contains the boots formula to move from rock bottom back into action in any situation, especially right now. The life has knocked you down. Pick yourself up with bootstraps and bra straps. Get your copy at www.sheilamack.com today. <laughs> 